I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Lisa Hajar, who is an associate professor in the sociology department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. This year, we've been fortunate that she is a visiting associate professor in Kesar, where she's been teaching courses in the sociology of human rights and law, and in law, politics, and the war on terror. Dr. Hajar is internationally known for her work in the legal dimensions of Israeli occupation and the US war on terror. She's expanding her scholarly interests into the realms of torture across the global geographies of the war on terror. Dr. Hajar is the author of Courting Conflict, the Israeli Military Court System in the West Bank and Gaza. She's also working on a book about anti-torture lawyering in the US post 9-11. And she's also just published a monograph called Torture, a Sociology of Violence and Human Rights. Finally, Dr. Hajar is one of the founding editors of the online publication, Jadalia. Dr. Hajar's talk tonight, this evening, is called Lawfare and Armed Conflict, Comparing Israeli and U.S. Targeted Killing Policies and Challenges Against Them. Please help me welcome Professor Lisa Hajar. Thank you. It's really great to see people. Anyone who's feeling flexible and or tired, you can come and sit on the floor. I think there might be a little bit more room there. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight. And it's really a great honor and pleasure to be, uh, for this year, part of the faculty at KSAR and affiliated with the Assam Faris Institute. So without further ado, I'm going to talk about, um, as, as Alex said, uh, lawfare and armed conflict. And uh, you know, my work on targeted killing grows out of my interest in torture. And in some sense, part of what I'm going to be talking about today, or at least alluding to today, um, has to do with the way in which both in the Israeli case and in the United States, in the case of the war on terror, um, torture and efforts by the, U the Israeli and U.S. governments to legalize torture uh, precede efforts to legalize targeted killing. Now, the term lawfare, for those of you who aren't um, aware of it, it's amalgamation of the words law and warfare. And it was really, it was coined in the, right at the turn of this century, in the year uh, 2001, um, by, in an essay by a then-serving U.S. Air Force colonel named Charles Dunlap, who, um, you know, basically was arguing that lawfare is when people use law as a weapon of war or as a method of waging war. So to some extent, and for some people, it has a negative connotation. I mean, it has a negative connotation to those kind of people who don't like to see um, instances in which state officials are legally constrained in pursuing their prerogatives or where their discretion to pursue national security goals are fettered. Um, and per certainly not to see the pursuit of accountability for uh, law, you know, war, war crimes and other violations. So just to give one example of how this kind of negative meaning uh, emerges, in the 2005 National Security Strategy of the United States, st uh, annual statement about what's you know, going on, uh, one line reads, our strength as a nation state will continue to be challenged by those who employ a strategy of the weak using international fora, judicial processes, and terrorism. So it's conflating uh, going to court with terrorism. But Israeli officials and supporters of the state also deploy the term lawfare to cr decry criticism of Israeli violations and efforts to hold uh, individuals accountable for alleged war crimes. Um, and they charge that lawfare is one manifestation of an international campaign to delegitimize Israel in the same, for them, despised company with the um, boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And um, Prime Minister Netanyahu, among others, has characterized lawfare as a strategic threat. And in 2010, an uh, NGO, an organization called the Lawfare Project, was established with a mission to basically defend both US and Israeli governmental interests from critics. And um, the Lawfare Project has a banner at the top of its website that proclaims, lawfare is an increasingly emergent form of asymmetric warfare, which must be countered both tactically and strategically. The Lawfare Project defines the term and its dangerousness as, and I'm quoting, the use of law as a weapon of war, or more specifically, the abuse of law and judicial systems to achieve strategic military or political ends. It consists of the negative manipulation of international and national human rights laws to accomplish purposes other than or contrary to those for which they were originally enacted, and to frustrate and hinder the ability of democracies to fight against and defeat terrorism. 
Um, let me simply say that for the very reasons people don't like lawfare, I love lawfare. Anyway, so in this uh, talk, uh, which is going to focus comparatively on U U.S. and Israeli policies of targeted killing, as well as the legal challenges to them, which would be the lawfare. But in order to name a phenomenon that's integral to this, you know, developing relationship between law and war, I've you know, sort of coined the concept of state lawfare in order to describe the way in which government officials, in this case Israelis and Americans, construct interpretive edifices to project the lawfulness of policies that deviate from international interpretations of international humanitarian law, or IHL. And IHL is the main body of the laws of war. So um, this talk has three components. I'm first going to just sort of lay out state lawfare as a concept and then talk a little bit about Israeli and American state lawfare. Then I'm going to discuss um, you know, both the emerging policies of targeted killing in Israel and the United States and those two governments' efforts to legalize what they were doing. And the third um, part of the talk will talk about legal challenges to Israeli and American uh, targeted killing. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in my previous work on, or some of my previous work on um, Israel and the United States, I actually talked about how first Israel, then the United States pursued efforts to legalize torture. Um, and in this sense, you know, that phenomenon and the one I'm talking about now, both are instances where Israeli officials really pioneered what I call state lawfare. Um, rather than ignoring inconvenient international laws, they forged original, and by which I mean international consensus-defying interpretations, to project the legality of state practices, starting in um, July 19, in, uh, with the July 1967 decision, of course, a month after the occupation, to reject the de jure applicability of the Fourth Geneva Convention which is the main body of IHL pertaining to militarily occupied territories. So officials basically rejected that the um, Geneva Conventions apply to the West Bank and Gaza on the grounds, they argued, that those areas are not technically occupied. And they did so by arguing that they aren't occupied because in 1967 they were not sovereign to the states that were displaced, namely Jordan in the West Bank, Gaza in Egypt. And although this interpretation that the West Bank and Gaza were not occupied but administered it never obtained international credibility. But nevertheless, it became the cornerstone of Israeli policymaking, Israeli doctrine for the state's rights in those areas and for the limited rights of Palestinians who reside there. Um, now, in this context, it's also worth noting that Israel, you know, in 1967, 1968, wanted to project politically the idea that the occupation or the administration of the West Bank and Gaza were benign, they opened up the possibility for Palestinians from those areas to petition the High Court of Justice if they felt that there were certain, they could petition against government policies or military policies and practices. Um, and in fact, over the decades, thousands and thousands of petitions have been submitted to the High Court of Justice by Palestinians. Um, however, you know, in challenging the legality of state practices. But with rare exceptions, the High Court of Justice has sanctioned state practices and reinforced the state lawfare premises underlying them. So the ju judicial record, as far as Palestinians go, is described by Nimr Sultani as, and I'm quoting, oppression-blind jurisprudence, concealment of the general context, fragmentation of reality, the practice of non-intervention and submission to dubious security considerations disguised rhetorically as balancing and proportionality tests, and declining to provide meaningful and timely legal remedies. So then one must ask, first in that case, but it's a much larger question, what's the point of going to court? If it's so rare that the courts, in this case the High Court of Justice, will find against the state and in favor of the petitioners, um, and in fact will reinforce the, these state lawfare interpretations. Well, specifically to that context, Hassan Jabarin, who's the executive director of Adala, locates the value of litigation in a transnational and political context to argue that even when petitioners lose, taking cases to court functions um, as a means of exposing the rationales of the state's positions. And I'm going to actually come back to this in the latter part, this, this argument about the value of litigation. So in terms of how Israel's lawfare, state lawfare adapts specifically 
building up to targeted killing, Israeli state lawfare took a new course in the 1990s as a result of political changes resulting from the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Um, while the Oslo Accords did not end the occupation, and let me be very clear, the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza in their entirety continues. But the, anyway, the occupation didn't end, but there was military redeployment from Palestinian population centers, that is, areas A, and the establishment of a Palestinian authority, or PA. And this prompted Israel to assert that areas under the semi-autonomous control of the PA from 1994 on had become somehow differently foreign. And this becomes highly significant following the breakdown of negotiations in July 2000 and the start of the Second Intifada in September, which almost immediately detonates into a full-scale armed conflict. So Israel characterized those spreading protests as acts of aggression and loosened the military's rules of engagement, including um, the uh, use of heavy weapons such as tanks and helicopter gunships. Under international consensus-based interpretations of IHL, massive use of military force by an occupying state in occupied territories and against occupied civilians who are protected persons under IHL would be categorically illegal. So the state lawfare rationale advanced to justify this war model was premised on assertions that the law enforcement model, namely you know, policing and riot control tactics, was no longer viable because the military was out of Palestinian areas and because Palestinians possessed arms, i.e. small arms, and thus constituted a foreign armed adversary. Officials asserted Israel's self-defense right to attack an enemy entity while denying those stateless enemies had any right to use force, including in self-defense. So these Israeli um, state law for innovations at the turn of the century are explained rather vividly in a Haaretz article about the International Law Division, or ILD, of the Military Advocate General's Unit, which is basically the main lawyers who do legal interpretation within the Israeli military. According to Daniel Reisner, who headed the ILD until 2005, and I'm quoting, what we are seeing now is a revision of international law. If you do something for long enough, the world will accept it. The whole of international law is now based on the notion that an act that is forbidden today becomes permissible if executed by enough countries. International law progresses through violations. We invented the targeted assassination thesis and we had to push it. At first there were protrusions that made it hard to insert easily into the legal molds. Eight years later it is at the center of the bounds of legitimacy. Now at the start of the Second Intifada, September of 2000 uh, and going up into the spring, the United States joined other governments in criticizing Israel's excessive use of force. And in fact, the United States sent a fact-finding mission headed by George Mitchell in the spring of 2001. And Reisner describes, uh, you know, sort of meeting with Mitchell and basically trying to persuade Mitchell unsuccessfully at that time that fighting terrorism requires a war model, not a law enforcement model. Mitchell wasn't buying it. But what Reisner then said, says is it took four months and four planes to change the opinion of the United States. And had it not been for those four planes, I am not sure we would have been able to develop the thesis of the war against terrorism on the present scale. So indeed, following the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, and the launching of a global war on terror, some of the key elements of the Israeli state lawfare model were emulated by the Bush administration. So for example, over State Department dissent White House and Justice Department lawyers asserted, and President George Bush accepted, um, that the Geneva Conventions are inapplicable to U.S. conduct in a war against stateless enemies. So the U.S. Um, state lawfare edifice in its entirety is termed, or was termed, the new paradigm. Since 2004, there's been a flourishing of litigation in the United States to challenge U.S. policies, you know, in terms of the war on terror. Although most war on terror related cases in the U.S. to date have focused mainly on the treatment of prisoners, everything from torture, um, you know, conditions at Guantanamo, habeas corpus at Bagram, et cetera, et cetera. As in Israel, with a handful of landmark exceptions, 
in the, in the Supreme Court. U.S. courts have tended either to actively endorse the position of the state by accepting state lawfare interpretations or passively endorse them by declining to hear cases on the grounds that alleged violations are non-justiciable political questions or would implicate state secrets or would breach accused officials' right to immunity. Okay, so now uh, coming to part two to talk about targeted killing as policy and practice. And again, beginning in the Israeli context, what I would describe as from the doing and denying phase to the legalization phase. So during the first intifada, between 80, 1987 and the early 1990s, Israel instituted a secret policy of targeted killing in the occupied territories. At that time, when the territories were indisputably under the full control of the Israeli military and Palestinians were being arrested um, and prosecuted or administratively detained in unprecedented numbers. In fact, at that time, Israel had the highest per capita prison population in the entire world. Killing suspects clearly constituted extrajudicial executions. So to evade those war crimes allegations, Israel's targeted killing policy was staunchly denied. In 1992, a government spokesperson responding to a B'Tselem report about undercover killings said, quote, there is no policy and there will never be a policy or a reality of willful killing of suspects. The principle of the sanctity of life is a fundamental principle of the IDF. IDF is the Israel Defense Forces. Now, important factors driving the uptick of tar targeted killing um, during the 1990s were, as I mentioned, the redeployment of the military out of Areas A, as well as the introduction in 1993 of suicide bombings by Palestinian Islamists. And indeed, there were about 14 suicide bombings between 93 and 2000. But the other factor, I think, was um, Israel's achievement in developing remote surveillance and te uh, targeting technologies. In the year 2000, Israel was the world leader in the development of drone technology. So the doing and denying phase ended on November 9th, 2000, six weeks into the Second Intifada, when Israeli forces killed uh, a Fatah militant named Hussein Abayat and also killed two women bystanders. For the first time, Israel, um, the government acknowledged responsibility. So as with its pioneering legacy of legalizing torture, and I, legalizing should be in quotation marks, in 1987, Israel was the first state in the world to publicly proclaim the legality of preemptive targeted killing. Officials asserted the lawfulness of this practice on the following basis. One, Palestinians were to blame for the hostilities, which constituted a war of terror against Israel. Two, the laws of war permit states to kill their enemies. Three, targeted individuals were ticking bombs who had to be killed because they could not be arrested. And four, killing terrorists by means of assassination is a legitimate form of national self-defense. And the deaths of untargeted civilians were termed, in accordance with the discourse of war, collateral damage. Now, Thabit Thabit, a member of the PA, uh, was assassinated on December 31, 2000. Afterwards, Deputy Defense Minister Ephraim Snay stated, and I quote, we will hit all those involved in terrorist operations, attacks, or preparations for attacks. And the fact of having a position within the Palestinian Authority confers no immunity on anyone. By November 2001, one year into the publicly proclaimed policy, 47 people had been targeted and 80 deaths had resulted. Now, the most notorious targeted killing operation occurred on July 22, 2002, um, when an F-16 launched a one-ton bomb to assassinate Salah Shahade, um, a leader of Hamas's military wing. The bomb destroyed the apartment building where Shahade lived and eight nearby buildings and destroyed nine others in the densely populated uh, Gaza neighborhood of Al-Daraj. In addition to Shahadi and his guard, 14 Palestinians, including eight children, um, were killed and more than 150 people were, were injured. Now, in this instance, the Israeli military responded to a public outcry about the size of the bomb, the targeting of a residential neighborhood, and the high casualty rate by conducting an investigation. But the finding of this internal investigation justified targeting Shahade as a perpetrator of terrorist violence while conceding that there had been, quote, shortcomings in the information available, namely the presence of innocent civilians in the vicinity of what was claimed to be Shahade's operational hideout, 
also known as his house. Um, between the start of the Second Intifada and September 30th, 2012, 434 Palestinians were killed during targeted killing operations, of whom 259 were the targets. And this statistic excludes all Palestinians killed by other means. Now, as far as the United States uh, policy goes, um, targeted killing or political assassination had been prohibited since 1977 by orders signed by every president, uh, you know, from 1977 until September 2001. At that point, President Bush secretly authorized the CIA, a civilian organization, to capture or kill suspected terrorists around the world. The first drone strike outside of the hot war zone of Afghanistan occurred on November 3rd, 2002, when a CIA-operated predator launched from Djibouti, fired a, hell um, a Hellfire missile into a car in Yemen. The target was Qa'id Salim Sinan al-Hrithi, um, one of the other six passengers killed in the strike, Kamal D um, Darwish, was a U.S. citizen. Afterwards, U.S. officials utilized Israeli-like reasoning to justify the operation, proclaiming that because Harithi was a member of al-Qaeda and allegedly involved in the 2000 bombing of the USS Cole, his, and his arrest was not possible, targeted killing was a legitimate tactic, even in a country where the U.S. was not at war. Now, during the Bush administration, Targeted killing by drones was done primarily by the CIA, but cap for most of the Bush administration, capture was the preferred option because of the national security imperative to elicit actionable intelligence. The strategic choice between capturing and killing terror suspects and militants began to shift in 2006, following the Supreme Court's Hamdan v. Rumsfeld decision. And that decision was based on a case challenging the lawfulness of the military commissions at Guantanamo. But in their decision, the Supreme Court concluded that, you know, Notwithstanding the claims that the Geneva Conventions don't apply, at minimum, common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions does apply to the treatment of prisoners in U.S. custody. And therefore, torture and other violations are prosecutable offenses. The Bush administration condemned the decision, but nevertheless emptied the CIA black sites and relocated 14 high-value uh, detainees, including those who are on trial right now, to Guantanamo. After that, transfers to Guantanamo tapered off, and the last person moved into Guantanamo was in 2008. That year, 2008, there was a 94% increase in drone strikes from the year before. Since 2009, when Barack Obama assumed the presidency, targeted killing has escalated dramatically in terms of the number of strikes per month and the widening geographic scope. Under the Obama administration, separate kill lists and drone fleets are maintained by the CIA and the military's Joint Special Operations Command, or JSOC. Targeted raids by JSOC, first introduced in Iraq in 2006, were transported along with the drones to Afghanistan in 2009. By April 2011, they were occurring at a rate of 1,000 a month, and that means basically 1,000 uh, people being killed a month by JSOC uh, forces. Now, U.S. claims about the legality of targeted killing hew to the same lines of argument as those of Israel. However, the geographic scope um, uh, and the rates of attacks and the rates of casualties differ significantly. One other significant difference between Israel and the United States is that the U.S. has claimed the right to target citizens abroad. On January 27, 2010, the Washington Post reported that at least three citizens had been designated for extrajudicial execution. The first name on that list was Anwar el Alaki, an American-born uh, Muslim cleric residing in, in Yemen. He was characterized as a leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Alaki's name had been added to the list um, in late 2009 on the heels of two incidents to which he was reportedly linked, but he was never indicted for these incidents. The, and the two incidents were the Fort Hood massacre by Major Nidal uh, Malik Hus um, Hassan and an attempt by Nigerian Omar Farouk Abdulmutallab to detonate a bomb hidden in his underwear on a transatlantic flight bound for Detroit. Now, the, the Washington Post's revelation that the government intended to lethally target citizens spurred criticisms and questions about, you know, the secret 
yet expanding drone warfare. And so from that point onwards, there have been a spate of, uh, you know, public addresses by various people in the Bush, in the Obama administration um, to, you know, talk about the legality and the efficacy of targeted killing in general terms, while maintaining that the planning and conduct of such operations are classified. Um, now, on, and for any of you who have seen Zero Dark Thirty, um, you will be familiar in narrative, you know, fictionalized form of the May 2000, uh, May 1, 2011 joint JSOC CIA operation in which a team of Navy SEALs raided uh, the compound in central Pakistan and executed Osama bin Laden. Several hours after that operation, uh, President Obama addressed the nation, stating, tonight I can report to the American people and the world that justice has been done. Now, most Americans, including many law of war experts, endorsed the legality of the bin Laden operation because bin Laden was regarded as a military, a legitimate military target. Although some questioned the wisdom of engaging in a raid inside of Pakistan without that government's knowledge, and others bemoaned that killing rather than capturing um, bin Laden deprived the victims of 9-11 of the kind of actual justice the prosecution would provide. So while the operation seemed to vindicate the claim that targeted killing was effective in eliminating terrorists, bin Laden's unique status did not resolve debates about the legality of the policy in general. Five days after the bin Laden operation, sort of riding high on uh, you know, the achievements of that, the U.S. launched a drone attack in Yemen targeting al awlaki that mission failed to kill him, but two others died. However, then on September 30th, 2011, a joint CIA JSOC drone strike killed al Olaki and another U.S. citizen who was with him, Samir Khan, along with two others. So as he had done after the killing of Osama bin Laden, Obama publicly declared that the attack had dealt a major blow to al-Qaeda. On October 14th, another drone attack killed al Olaki's 16-year-old son, Abdul Rahman, his 17-year-old cousin, and five others while they were dining in an open outdoor restaurant. Now, sort of in, right in the midst of these two operations, the killing of Alaki and Khan and his son, um, on October 8th of 2011, the New York Times published an expose based on anonymous sources about the contents of a secret Office of Legal Counsel memo to the Defense Department, which had been authored in 2010. And the propitiousness of making this public address today is that the memo was authored in 2010. There's been a lot of litigation to get it out yesterday. It came out. I'm not sure if it was leaked or um, actually released. But indeed, um, it's about the leg legality of targeting citizens in general and Alaki in particular. And the legal uh, um, analysis, in essence, concluded that Mr. Alaki could legally be killed if it was not feasible to capture him because intelligence agencies said that he was taking part in the war between the United States and Al Qaeda and posed a significant threat to Americans, as well as because Yemeni. Um, authorities were unable or willing to stop him. And I might just interject, having looked at the document uh, that came out, I mean, it elaborates more than what the New York Times at the time was able to get from its anonymous sources, that it simply says that if a high-ranking official, a, a fit, an official, you know, you know, says that basically there is, you know, legitimate reason to assume that a person poses an imminent threat, that would seem to be the criteria. And the, and the document itself now is available online. So the whole national self-defense reasoning about why it's okay to kill a citizen hinges on the assertion that the target poses an imminent and grave threat to national security. However, the government has never um, provided information to substantiate the allegation that al Olaki's role, in the words of one official, had changed from inspirational to operational. So on March 5th, um, 2012, and this was building up into the kind of uh, presidential campaign that we just got through, Attorney General Eric Holder delivered a national security speech in which he addressed critics of the targeted <laughs> killing policy. I'm quoting Holder. Some have called such operations assassinations. They are not, and the use of that loaded term is misplaced. Assassinations are unlawful killings. The U.S. government's use of lethal force and self-defense against a leader of al-Qaeda or an associated force who presents an imminent threat of violent attack would not be unlawful. 
on the targeted, um, uh, targeting of citizens, Holder said, and again I quote, the government must take into account all relevant constitutional considerations. Some have argued that the president is required to get permission from a federal court before taking action. This is simply not accurate. Due process and judicial process are not one and the same, particularly when it comes to national security. The Constitution guarantees due process, not judicial process. And indeed, the following day, American comedian Stephen Colbert lampooned Holder's speech, saying, due process, it's the process we do. So <laughs> in, in late May, you know, shortly after, uh, two um, you know, publications, the Daily Beast and the New York Times, published almost simultaneously uh, new exposés de detailing what this um, actual, you know, what this due process we do is. Um, and according, you know, sort of both of them have found similar things. So according to the Times, Mr. Obama has placed himself at the top, at the helm of a top secret nomination process to designate terrorists for killer capture, of which the capture part has become largely theoretical. Both articles describe personality strikes which target specific individuals and signature strikes which target groups of men who bear certain signatures or defining characteristics associated with terrorist activity but whose identities aren't known. And both articles also explain the administration's method for deflecting criticism of civilian casualties by counting all military age males in a strike zone as combatants unless there is explicit intelligence posthumously proving them innocent. Now, in October of 2012, um, again, building up to the last election, the Washington Post broke another big story, um, namely that since 2010, the National Counterterrorism Center, the NTC, NCTC, has been developing a secret blueprint called a disposition matrix to coordinate the multiple targeting lists and drone programs. The disposition matrix is a single, continually evolving database in which biographies, locations, known associates, and affiliated organizations are all cataloged. So are strategies for taking targets down, including extradition requests, capture operations, and drone patrols. Now, the names on the US, uh, on the matrix, and the criteria for being listed for targeted killing are secret. They've been secret, they are secret. But those knowledgeable about the disposition matrix anticipate that it will remain a counterterrorism mainstay for years. So this describes the American and, and Israeli things. And now I want to focus um, on lawfare, on the challenges to the legality of these policies. So just as Israel sort of is always out the gate first, so too are challenges to Israel's policies. Um, in January 2001, the first petition challenging Israel's targeted killing policy was filed in the High Court of Justice by Saham um, Thabit, the wife of Thabit Thabit. A second petition was filed by Knesset member Mohammed Barake for an order Nisi and an interim junction, basically asking the court to freeze the policy while it considered uh, whether the, the policy was legal. Both of those petitions were dismissed by the High Court one year later with a brief statement. And the court said, the choice of means of warfare used by respondents to preempt murderous terrorist attacks is not the kind of issue the court would see fit to intervene in. However, <coughs> excuse me, on January, in January 2002, Another petition was submitted to the High Court. This one filed by the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel and Law, which is a Palestinian um, NGO. And the High Court apparently reconsidered its position on non-justiciability, accepted the petitions, and requested briefs from the, from the two sides about the applicable laws and relevant rules of armed conflict. On September 30th of 2003, while this, you know, pre-trial stuff was going on, the Israeli organization Yeshkavul submitted a petition pressing for a criminal investigation for the officials responsible for the Shahade operation. So the high court um, accepted the Yeshgavul petition, but deferred it until they were going to issue their ruling on the legality of targeted killing as a policy. The High Court um, decision uh, comes out in December of 2006, and it was written by former Chief Justice Aharon Barak. And it begins with what it calls a factual background, which states, and I'm quoting the decision, a massive assault of terrorism was directed against the state of Israel and against Israelis merely because they are Israelis. So then the decision summarizes the petitioners, that's Kati and Law, and the respondents, that's the state's positions. 
The petitioners asserted that the state has no right to militarize self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter against occupied civilian population because it is an occupying state. And also noted the prohibition of arbitrary killing and execution without due process as violations of customary norms of international law. Moreover, the petitioners argued, targeted killing fails the imminent threat and proportionality tests. Most individuals were not taking part in hostilities at the time when they were killed, and Israel has a lesser harm option of arresting people, because indeed, Israel continues to arrest people from both the West Bank and Gaza. The petitioners also challenged the secrecy that, de um, that deprives targeted individuals of any opportunity to prove their innocence. And this problem is exacerbated by the numerous mistakes and compounded by the fact that officials offer no evidence before or after targeted killings to prove claims of imminent threat. So the respondents, that is government officials, advanced arguments to persuade the high court of the legality of targeted killing. And here, Israel's evolved doctrine um, that the uh, territories are no longer occupied, you know, since 2000, was elemental to the claim that the response to terrorism emanating from an enemy entity is not limited to law enforcement approaches. So despite the military's ability to pursue and arrest people alive, the respondents asserted that killing is an exceptional step performed only when there is no alternative. On the issue of imminence, in other words, how imminent is the threat, the respondents claim that this does not reflect a rule of customary international law and argue that the concepts of direct part and hostilities must be given wide berth to include planning, assisting, abetting, and not just be limited to the active use of arms and violence. Now, in its judgment, the High Court, as it does in other decisions, refers to the occupied territories as the area or outside the bounds of the state. And in so doing, it evades the central question, which is whether Palestinians are protected persons. The armed conflict is described by the court as between Israel and terrorist organizations, and the decision claims that there has been, and I quote, a continuous situation of armed conflict since the first intifada. The conclusion the High Court reaches in regard to, and I'm quoting, the targeted killing and in our terms, the preventative strike causing the deaths of terrorists and at times also of innocent civilians is that neither are such strikes always permissible or that they are always forbidden. So some operations, as the court reasoned, might be unlawful if, for example, a disproportionate amount of force was used to eliminate a legitimate target, but they decided the policy as such is not illegal. And so this decision, which has been very influential to the US, I would add, um, is another instance in which international law is interpreted by the state and endorsed by the High Court of Justice to frame existing state practice as compatible with the law itself. So then the High Court, after the decision, lifted the Yesh Gavul petition and requested the state to investigate whether the Shahadi operation had uh, comported with the ruling. So a special investigatory commission was established in 2008. It concluded in 2011 that the operation was a legitimate targeted killing, but in hindsight, the difficult collateral consequences were disproportionate. However, those consequences were unintended, undesired, and unforeseen, and therefore no disciplinary offenses were committed and no criminal charges are warranted. And just as a sort of final point on this, according to a 2008 investigative article by Haaretz, the only thing in practical terms that the uh, high court decision changed was that the military started rephrasing what it was doing and claiming that pre-planned kill operations were actually planned to be arrest operations that went awry and then required uh, the use of force. And indeed, um, uh, you know, essentially proving that they were lying to the court. And I would add that the journalist who wrote that article, based on leaked material, was himself imprisoned for the inf making that information public. Now, in the US context, in terms of challenges to um, targeted killing, only since 2009 have there been some lawsuits filed, um, and mainly over two kinds of issues, the legality of targeted, targeting citizens and Freedom of Information Act or FOIA litigation to puncture the thick you know, shroud of secrecy surrounding the policy. So the very first case that was litigated followed the news, you know, the, um, the Washington Post report that citizens were being listed, including Enra al followed that news that he had been placed on a, on a hit list. 
The American Civil Liberties Union, or the ACLU, and the Center for Constitutional Rights, or CCR, which I might add are two organizations that have been absolutely at the forefront of litigating U.S. Um, law violations since the beginning of the war on terror. So ACLU and CCR filed a lawsuit on behalf of Alaki's father, Nasser, to challenge executive authorization to extrajudicially execute a citizen. The Justice Department's response brief urged the court to dismiss on procedural grounds, namely that the elder Alaki lacked standing because the government wasn't planning to kill him. Two other reasons were offered. Either the court could toss out the case um, because any assessment of the plaintiff's claims would require the court to decide non-justiciable um, political questions, or even if the court thought that the case had merit, the information needed to litigate it um, would be properly protected by military and state secrets privilege. So indeed, on, in December of 2010, the court dismissed the case um, on the political standing grounds and also noted that anything about the drone um, program is in fact a political question that should be handled by Congress and the executive branch. Less than one year later, Al-Awlaki, Samir Khan, and Al-Awlaki's son, Abdurrahman, were killed. So the other case coming out of that, which was filed last summer in July, um, the ACLU and CCR filed a civil suit on behalf of Nasr al awlaki and um, Sarah Khan, who's the mother of Samer, uh, naming Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta, then, now former, CIA Director David Petraeus, um, and two JSOC commanders, Admiral William McRaven and Lieutenant General Joseph Votel, accusing them of violating the Constitution's fundamental guarantee against deprivation of life without due process. The citizenship status, it's the citizenship status of these three that actually provides this opening. Um, and on December 14th, just you know, a month and a half ago, lawyers for the plaintiffs filed a motion to dismiss, urging that the court, this court should do what all the other courts in America have done, which is basically decline to accept uh, these cases and dismiss them. But if this case is not dismissed, and, you know, I mean, it may be, but who knows. Um, it would mark the very first attempt in the U.S. to adjudicate the meaning of direct participation in hostilities and imminent threat in relation to the policy of targeted killing. Now, the other trajectory of state of uh, lawfare is a quest for information. And there's been some, you know, FOIA litigation. Um, and so, you know, Two of them, one of them is um, what is called the drones FOIA. Uh, you know, since uh, 2000, uh, the ACLU has been trying to get information from, um, you know, about the legal basis of the drone policy, about the standards that govern drone operators, about information about civilians and non-civilians who've been killed. Some of the information has been provided by some government agencies, defense, state, et cetera. The CIA, however, the CIA's position is that not only will they not provide information, they staunchly refuse to confirm or deny that they even operate a drone program, despite the fact that there have been innumerable public statements about the CIA's drone program. Um, the other, uh, another track of FOIA was basically the effort to get information about the targeting of, cit of citizens, and including litigation since 2010 for the OLC memo, which, as I just mentioned, came out, um, and I don't think, uh, I'm not sure exactly how it came out, but it, for that memo, as well as all evidentiary uh, material related to Elo Laki and other citizens. Um, so that case was joined with the New York Times case. On January 2, that's you know less or about a month ago, the case was dismissed. But I want to read just briefly from the, the judge's decision because it really captures, in a sense, this incredible paradox. So the judge who dismissing the case says, this court is constrained by law. And under the law, I can only conclude that the government has not violated FOIA by refusing to turn over the documents. And so cannot be compelled by this court of law to explain in detail the reasons why its actions do not violate the Constitution and the laws of the United States. The Alice in Wonderland nature of this pronouncement is not lost on me. But after careful and extensive consideration, I find myself stuck in a paradoxical situation in which I cannot solve a problem because of contradictory constraints and rules, a veritable catch-22. I find no way around the thicket of laws and precedents that effectively allow the executive branch of our government to proclaim as perfectly lawful certain actions that seem on their face incompatible with our Constitution and laws, while keeping the reasons for their conclusion a secret. 
Now, there's been one more FOIA litigation um, filed in the United States. I mean, this one has to do with a targeted killing operation um, uh, in, two, in December 2009, an attack in Al Majala region of Yemen that killed 46 people, including at least 21 children and 14 women, five of whom were pregnant. In fact, in other words, almost all the people killed were either women or children. Initially, the, the Yemeni government claimed responsibility, um, but the ruse was undermined when unnamed American officials gave statements to the media confirming that it was a U.S. strike. In January 2010, WikiLeaks released a classified diplomatic cable about a meeting after the attack between then head of U.S. Central Command Petraeus and then Yemeni um, President Ali Abdullah Saleh, in which it was agreed secretly that Yemen would claim responsibility for all U.S. attacks in the Abayan province. Now, this FOIA request um, seeks records and intelligence on the intelligence that prompted the strike, what, if any, steps have been taken to investigate the killing of civilians and to compensate survivors um, and, their fa and, and victims' families, and why a U.S. official would plot with a foreign government to deceive the publics in both countries. So uh, that case hasn't gone far, but I just to summarize the U.S. government's position um, on targeted killing, and just to simply stress that targeted killing has become the centerpiece of U.S. war policy and counterterrorism efforts. And so the, the government's position is a paradoxical blend of secrecy, selective leaking, public statements to take credit for the program's efficacy, claims about its legality, and minimum uh, civilian casualties. But in response to litigation, Specifically, the government simply shuts down and maintains that the program is classified. Now, I'm briefly just, just going to summarize a few efforts to pursue accountability or some legal challenges to Israel and the United States elsewhere. And the question that, that this raises is, does targeted killing as practiced by the U.S. and Israeli the Israeli and U.S. governments comply with or violate international law? Both of these governments assert that their policies are legal, although they've reinterpreted the law in certain ways. Um, and national courts have gone along with that. But these <laughs> positions do not enjoy much international endorsement. On the contrary, the, the legality of targeted killing is a matter of international controversy. And so one way in which this controversy is being pursued is by pursuing accountability for Israelis or in some ways challenging the US and other courts. Um, so ironically, the first case in a foreign court, one of the first cases in a foreign court to try and get accountability for Israelis was in a US court. And that was when um, <laughs> CCR filed a class action lawsuit against Avraham Dichter, um, who was the head of the, the General Security Service, um, alleging his responsibility for the Shahadi operation and for escalating targeted killing. And um, the, the defendants, the, the petitioners, were represented by the Palestine Center for Human Rights, the Gaza-based Palestine Center. Um, and at, the reason that the lawsuit could be brought was at the time it was brought, Dichter was living in Washington, DC. He was a fellow at the Brookings Institute. So the, so the Bush administration submitted a statement of interest basically saying he's an official, anything he did as an official you know, can't be prosecuted, and urged the court to dismiss. The court did dismiss, but CCR petitioned, saying basically that war crimes, you know, there is no immunity for war crimes, and, and in that sense was trying to pursue the case, but it never got off the ground. <laughs> so just to say a couple of other um, countries, and I'll be very brief, where it was specifically the Shahadi operation, because of like the size of the bomb, the number of deaths, where accountability has been pursued. So one case was in the United Kingdom against Daron um, Al-Mog, who headed Israel's Southern Command at the time. Um, and so uh, an arrest warrant was actually issued for uh, um, Al-Mog uh, based on the information provided by uh, two British lawyers, um, Daniel Makover and Kate Maynard, coupling up with you know, PCHR, the Palestine Center for Human Rights. A judge reviewed the evidence and actually issued an arrest warrant. And so on September 10, 2005, when Al-Mog landed at Heathrow Airport, 
he, you know, uh, British officials came on to the plane to advise him that there were people waiting to take to arrest him <laughs> at the airport. But what happened was then the British government and the Israeli government intervened, and essentially Al Mulg was allowed to depart the country. Now, the plane was t allowed to fly away without Al Mulg ever being taken off of the plane. Um, there have been other uh, cases in the United Kingdom to try and um, arrest and indict Israeli officials, not just for targeted killing, but for other things. And consequently, as a, you know, for, on political basis, in 2011, the parliament narrowed the country's international law enforcement mechanisms by granting the director of public prosecutions veto power over uh, uh, arrest warrants for suspects from certain protected countries, namely important allies. So I'm just going to you know, sort of cite them and not go into detail. Similar pattern. In New Zealand, efforts were mounted to indict Moshe Alon. He was the chief of staff. An arrest warrant was prepared. But the police, as they were going off to pick up Yalon when he had landed in the country, tried to get the opinion of the Solicitor General. He asked the Attorney General. The Attorney General got scared, quashed the warrant. In Spain, um, and Spain, at this present time, has probably the most robust universal jurisdiction laws. Now, this is a long and complicated story, but there's actually been a case that continues to be alive in Spain, um, again, for the Shahadi case, uh, which names Almog, Dictor Ya'alon, Dan Halutz, who is the former commander of the Israeli Air Force, Benjamin Ben Eliezer, the former defense minister, his military advisor, and the former head of the Israeli National Security Council. Now, in the process of this case moving forward, what happened was, um, and again, it's a very political thing, where there was political pressure on judges who were pursuing the case to drop the case. But the judges, in a sense, refused to do so. So then there was political pressure from parliament. And ultimately, Spain did narrow its universal jurisdiction law, almost entirely on, on, under pressure from Israel, even though I would mention that there's also a case uh, in Spain now against Bush administration torture lawyers. But the one thing about the Spanish narrowing of the law was that it's, it, it said that only cases with a nexus to Spain, either Spanish victims or, or, or accused perpetrators who are present in Spain. So even under the narrowed law in 2010, the Spanish authorities refused Dictor a grant of immunity because if he came into the country, the nexus would be satisfied and he could be arrested. Now, in terms of the U.S., there have been very little um, legal like lawsuits directly challenging the U.S. so far. Again, it's, the history is short. Um, but really, we can just think about, the, the, again, the broader geographic scope and the much higher rates of killing. And so the main um, international controversy about U.S. targeted killing has to do with civilian uh, death, and particularly in Pakistan and Yemen. Um, and so there have been, you know, one case uh, which was not so much directly against the United States, but was in Britain challenging the foreign minister on the grounds that the British, um, what's that agency called? The General Communications Headquarters, which is a, like the CIA, it's a civilian organization, had provided intelligence to the CIA that was used in a targeted killing uh, on a jirga in northwest Pakistan that killed um, civilians. And that particular case was basically, the, the, the point of that case was to actually argue that British civilians who are abettors of what is murder, you know, you know, murder, because, you know, civilians have no right to fight, actually should be prosecuted for murder. And the point of that case was to basically force the British government to try to rethink sharing intelligence with the United States. Um, now, the, the, the case, as I understood it, was dismissed um, on uh, December 22nd of just last year. Um, and with, and led Lord Justice Moses, very lordy and justice and Mosesy, um, wrote, and I quote, the courts will not sit in judgment on the foreign acts of a foreign state because breaking with this principle would imperil relations between the states. However, I understand that since December 22nd and now, that case is on appeal. And in fact, it may very well, uh, you know, may come back into uh, reconsideration in British courts. And I would also mention that right after that decision was announced in Britain, the British Parliament announced the forming of a parliamentary committee or a commission to investigate the legal issues arising from drone warfare as part of a larger assessment of British war policies. 
Um, there have been cases in, you know, for example, in Pakistan, um, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism reported in February 2012 that the CIA in Pakistan had resumed a practice it had temporarily stopped of second strikes, or what Americans call double tapping, which means that once there's been a targeted killing, there's another attack on the same site that then subsequently kills rescuers. Um, and also, you know, the, the CIA resumed attacking funerals. Um, so in May of 2000, May, May 9, 2012, um, a Pakistani NGO filed two constitutional peti petitions in Pakistan's high court, challenging the government's failure to protect its citizens from U.S. drone strikes. Um, and essentially, basically saying that, the, that urging the court to force the Pakistani government to act, to do something, to actually take the issue of drone warfare to the International Criminal Court, to the United Nations, et cetera. Um, um, shortly after that case was filed, the UN Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, um, during a trip to Pakistan, called for an investigation in which drone strikes of civilians had died building up to something. Now, on June 21st of this past year, at a meeting held in conjunction with the United Nations um, you know, Human Rights Council's discussion of the US war on terror, Christoph Haynes, the special rapporteur for extrajudicial arbitrary or summary executions, characterized the CIA's second strikes on rescuers as war crime. On October 25th, 2012, in a speech at Harvard Law School, Ben Emerson, the special rapporteur on counterterrorism and human rights, announced that he and Haynes were going to establish an investigative unit in early 2003, and I'm quoting uh, Emerson, to inquire into individual drone attacks and other forms of targeted killing conducted in counterterrorism operations, in which it has been alleged that civilian casualties in have been inflicted. So explaining this decision, Emerson said, if the relevant states are not willing to establish effective independent monitoring mechanisms, then it may as a last resort be necessary for the UN to act. And specifically on the US stance about the legality of its positions in the war on terror, and, and that it has a global prerogative to execute people, Emerson stated, the global war paradigm has done immense damage to a previously shared international consensus on the legal framework underlying both international human rights law and international humanitarian law. It has also given a spurious justification to a range of serious human rights and humanitarian law violations. This war paradigm was always based on the flimsiest of reasoning and was not supported even by close allies of the United States. And indeed, on January 24th, two weeks ago, um, the establishment of that investigative unit composed of experts from different countries was announced. And so Emerson's point, his overarching point in the Harvard speech and in the press release that accompanied the announcement of this new investigative unit, um, his point was that if there was a time during the first years of this century when it was acceptable or tolerable for state responses to terrorism to trump respect for human rights and the rules of international humanitarian law, that time is over. The urgency of the investigation is driven foremost by the rapid expansion of drone warfare. So just to conclude, I would just say that first Israel and then the United States have attempted to reinterpret international law, and for the US federal law as well, to project the legality of their targeted killing policies and practices. They have attempted, you know, these attempts exemplify state lawfare because they deviate from and defy international consensus. In the case of Israel, the asserted right to engage in targeted killing in Gaza and the West Bank hinges on the internationally rejected proposition that they are no longer occupied and therefore are legitimate sites of warfare, and that extrajudicial execution of people who ostensibly cannot be arrested is a legitimate form of national self-defense. The U.S. also asserts the national self-defense right to execute people, including citizens, but applies this claim prerogative on a vastly larger scale. Now, I refer to these in reinterpretations as attempts because targeted killing has not gained international credibility. Lawfare has been a means of defending international consensus-based interpretations of IHL. Although courts in Israel and the US have failed to assist in this defense, in other countries where lawsuits have been mounted, 
even when those cases have been dismissed, and even when national laws have been narrowed to impede such cases in the future, there has been no foreign governmental endorsement of the legal justifications for targeted killing. Rather, those judicial outcomes are the result of political pressure, diplomatic arm twisting, or the desire not to offend, uh, offend allied governments. So lawfare has not yet succeeded to achieve accountability for extrajudicial executions and civilian deaths, nor forced a decisive return to international consensus-based behavior by either the Israeli or US government. Lawfare has, however, been a means of exposing the contents and the rationales of these states' positions. And this exposure has, in turn, contributed to making targeted killing an issue of increasing international concern and activity. So thus, the value of lawfare should not be judged solely on the basis of judicial outcomes, but rather on the political and transnational possibilities, evoking the words of Hassan Jabarin, that might arise from challenging law violations, even when the results are losses in court. Moreover, without such challenges, were there no such you know, challenges called lawfare, powerful states would be unhindered in their efforts to make international consensus defying policies they wish to employ appear legal. So let's recall Daniel Reisner's words. If you do something for long enough, the world will accept it. International law progresses through violations. Were Israel's and the United States efforts to actually make targeted killing legal as opposed to legal, then any targeted killing would become an option for any government. But the law has not been rewritten. So, yes. And I'm happy to entertain questions. Yes, okay, Alex. So, thank you for your talk, Lisa. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> At various moments, you talked about U.S. policy um, targeting killing as Israel like. I and mean, clearly, you want to talk about similarities or shared approaches or perhaps even overlapping logic. But is the relationship between targeted killing in both sites, is it a conjuncture? Is it an overlapping process? Or is it actually part of a, a shared circuit or a logic of transnational governance that may be shared among these two entities? Well, I do think that the fact that Israel did, both in the, in the efforts to reinterpret the laws to legalize torture and then the laws reinterpretation to legalize uh, targeted killing, when the United States did not engage in those kind of interpretations. So there is something about this sort of pioneering characteristic. Now, the United States, of course, can, and, and in both the torture memos, and one can see very clearly, if you even look at the document that just was declassified, it reads extraordinarily closely the things that came out uh, much earlier that Israel had produced. But certainly, um, the war on terror um, evinces the same kinds of things, like fighting a stateless enemy, wishing to be unfettered, um, operating, you know, sort of in an area where one wishes not to, you know, sort of give the enemy any rights, not the right, you know, in the United States case, to habeas corpus, or the right not to be tortured, or the right not to be, um, you know, targetedly killed. So there is, I think, some degree of, you know, first Israel, then the United States. But the, but there have been actually, in, in some ways in which the sharing goes back and forth, is that you know the, um, Israel emulated the United States on the whole uh, notion of the unlawful enemy combatant. I mean, Israel had attempted to put forward a law of that kind, like the rightlessness of certain prisoners in the mid-1990s, and it got nowhere in parliament. And it was only after the United States, after President Bush, said that, uh, that there is such a thing as un, you know, un, unlawful enemy combatants, then Israel passes its own law and used it mainly to uh, justify the imprisonment of kidnapped Lebanese and since 2005, uh, Gazans. Um, you know, so there is a little bit of back and forth. And the United States does go to some, um, I mean, the United States has to engage in, um, in some ways, more elaboration for what makes any ask, what makes any military activities in Somalia legal? What makes any military activities in Pakistan legal? So what the United States does, I mean, there's a bigger set of agendas. We declare global war on terror. So that doesn't require a bit more 
elaboration. And the, and the, the get out of jail free card that both the Bush administration and the Obama administration use is the authorization to use to to use military force, which was passed about five days after 9-11, which didn't set any territorial or temporal limits on the U.S. fight against terror. Yes? I just, I just want to push you on, on the territorial, or how, how the territorial is not constructed, because one reads that there are increasing plans to use drones for regular civilians <laughs> inside the U.S., for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. So to what extent, I mean, how does the global reconfigure territory in these in these lines of argument? I.e., uh, what is to repeat the same argument that you could do a strike inside national territory? Indeed, the um, you know one can find many cases on many different kinds of law violations of the slippery slope phenomenon. You know, and just I'll, I'll come back and answer your question well, about drugs. In the, in the sense that if you can global dissolves territory in mm -hmm. a sense and mm -hmm. all, all of the international yes. uh, human rights law and law, I mean, law, law of war mm -hmm. is constructed about territorial distinctions as you're saying yes. occupation uh, yeah. inside outside uh, yes well, I mean, indeed, so, so I'm just curious in, in terms of the logic not just the slippery slope but in terms of the fundamental logic what mm -hmm. extent is it dissolving territory mm -hmm. shut up no, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't think, well, I think that the territory is in a sense a manifest, a place where certain expanded um, powers then manifest themselves. So we could see, before I come back to the drones thing, the treatment, for example, of Bradley Manning, the person who's accused of having, you know, uh, made the, the leak that is the primary leak that WikiLeaks has been releasing for years. You know, initially, the, the legalization of torture by the U.S. was entirely intended to be utilized outside of the United States and on foreigners. But, I mean, one can see the treatment that, you know, the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Torture and um, has regarded the treatment of Bradley Manning as torture. So that is, in a sense, the, and he's been accused of being an enemy, aiding the enemy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one way in which you know, strategies then can sort of come back. A second um, example would be the National Defense Authorization Act, which is, you know, the recently passed law that military detention, which again was never permissible inside the United States, was only permissible outside the United States and not for U.S. citizens. I mean, that whole U.S. citizen thing matters. And now the NDAA does, um, in fact, permit the possibility of citizens or people in the United States being put in military tension in the United States. It's been litigated against. The government has, has you know, tried to preserve the prerogative, but said, like, well, we don't have any current plans to put any Americans in military tension, so don't worry about it. Um, but specifically on drones, I mean, the thing about, like, drones per se, I mean, drones can be very problematic, but so can, like, you know, those... Uh, Ca surveillance cameras everywhere. I want to, one thing I want to just make clear is like drones are a technology and targeted killing is a strategy to which drones are one of the technologies used. So while drones being used for surveillance purposes in the United States can, you know, should evoke people's concerns about privacy or whatever, you know, I mean, uh, th those kind of issues. Um, it's the, the drone question around territory. I mean, drones actually facilitate um, a riskless form of killing. And, and so a riskless form of killing, that's one thing. But then where the drones are using, the geographic expansion of the drones has to do then with the Obama administration's argument that he, as the President of the United States, has been authorized to pursue terrorists in order to defend America from imminent attack. So it's that sort of imminent argument, but that's the rationale. Now, the thing um, specifically, so one of the things uh, I would say about, like what's special about drones? I mean, the problem is many people fix it on drones. drones the, the thing that is special about drones is the fact that they're unmanned. And so they take the risk of battle. Not only can they go places where it's, you know, you can't necessarily send other kinds of troops, but they they eliminate the risk of battle. And if you can kill people in what you're calling a war, that's not on a battlefield. Is it battle and is it a war? I mean, I, I think that we are really dealing with some very fundamental types of questions. My assessment of of targeted killing via drones, the unmanned aspect, is that it's 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 the Air to snipers and perfidious attack, where you know people can kill 
without being um, able, you know, being at risk themselves. Perfidy is a war crime, per se, you know, point blank. Sniping is the lowest form of combat, you know, in a sense. One could say, and so already that kind of a thing. And now drones are moving in that direction. But it raises a really fundamental question. If killing can be called a war and done outside of the battlegrounds, what exactly does that mean? And I do believe that you know, certainly maybe not decisively, but this investigatory commission that Emerson and Haynes have established now under the auspices of the United Nations will at least begin sort of raising some of these questions and trying to, you know, put some legal international constraints on things. Yes? Uh, I'm impressed by your diagnosis and dissection of this issue. I wonder if you have uh, a prescription how to um, well, I personally have a prescription, but I find that my prescription is never, you know, completely popular. I believe like more litigation. I mean, I'm like a huge fan of universal jurisdiction. I love retributive justice. It's the best kind of justice. Universal jurisdiction, it's the best jurisdiction. But in order for countries, other than the United States and Israel, to be able to participate in international law enforcement, I think there needs to be more political uh, you know, movements in support of those governments. They're not allowing those governments to basically allow their own legal systems to be derailed. So there is a political angle to it. But I think because specifically what the United States and Israel do is framed as law, it really does require a litigatory uh, response. Not alone. I mean, certainly there's other uh, initiatives. but. You know, I always think like there's not enough lawsuits or more lawyers. <laughs> you can see why my views are not so popular, even among lawyers. Yeah. yeah the same question. It looks like lawfare is very limited to the U.S. and as well as countries. Could you quote like what can we see as France doing in Mali right now? Or are there any other countries or any other examples of people who are manipulating the idea of lawfare? No, well, they, um, indeed. I mean, lawfare might be like if now. Uh, French lawyers or Malian lawyers or any lawyers begin going after French officials on the grounds of what France is doing in Mali, that would be lawfare. To my knowledge, I mean, if, if France was going to go to the intellectual labor process of presenting what's going on in Mali as compatible with international law, that would be state lawfare. So the Mali intervention is relatively new, but indeed, it's, I mean, it's mainly that Israel and the United States have been far and away the only the governments that have gone to all these reinterpretive you know tasks in order to do things that most other countries don't claim is legal so they you know in other words much of the history is about Israel and the United States but it's certainly conceivable that other governments may follow that course and and one could even say that any efforts to pursue, I mean, even for example, you could characterize the, ca the case I briefly <coughs> mentioned in the United Kingdom against the, the British foreign secretary on, for giving information to the CIA as lawfare, you know, lawfare directed against a British official. So they're concepts, and then, but they've been practiced or you know, put into play most you know, uh, consistently in the context of Israel and the United States. Anybody else? Yes. Um, so, uh, uh, back uh, after the uh, Al -Al Alaki attacks, uh, I remember reading some speculation that, I don't remember the name of the, uh, of the law now, but that uh, basically the uh, Obama administration would argue that um, Alaki committed an act of treason and therefore became an, an enemy and was therefore, it was a free for all to attack him. Um, it, did that come up in the administration's argument, or did they not follow that line? Of I mean, th that's actually, I mean, treason is a legal concept, but that was a political argument. In other words, because al is a citizen, or was a citizen, um, the, you know, to kill him and to argue that the killing of him was essentially an act of war, a legitimate act of war, that's what the U.S. government said, um, you know, his treason would have been that he would be punishable if he ever came into U.S. custody. I mean, you know, if that was the accusation. But he was killed uh, on the grounds that, you know, he posed an imminent threat to the United States, that he was actually plotting and the United States had no uh, means of, um, you know, stopping him from posing a threat and the, and the president has the responsibility to stop that threat. 
perhaps that was true, but on what intelligence was that claim made? The United States has never released and has fought all the FOIA litigation. So it's that, you know, the treason category is certainly something that would have come up. But what's the, what's the, um, there's no allegation of treason against al 16-year-old son who was killed. And it's not clear. I mean, there have been conflicting, because so much of this is shrouded in secrecy, at first, in the immediate aftermath of the killing of Abdul Rahman, who was 16, and his 17-year-old cousin and the others, at first, in the immediate aftermath, the government claimed that Abdul Rahman was a 21-year-old militant. And then the grandfather, Nasser, produced his um, birth certificate proving that he was 16 at the time he was killed. And then the government went back into shutdown mode, saying the CIA will neither deny or acknowledge it. So in fact, the United States has never even officially acknowledged in, in the kind of oh, those official channels that, you know, that the, it was the U.S. that killed Al-Awlaki, his son, or Nasser Khan. They basically said Al-Awlaki was killed, you know, uh, this, is, this is a great uh, blow to Al-Qaeda, so. Yes. Hi. Hi, sorry. <laughs> um, this is a methodological kind of conceptual question, but I'm wondering if you could parse out, um, since I've heard you talk about this before, the kind of state of exception discourses around Schmidt and Nagamben and, and how that- Never gone. Yeah, Schmidt. Never person. But I'm, I'm just interested, <coughs> they both seem to entail yeah. lawfare and the state of exception, kind of, the frames seem to entail both interpretive practices that allow certain things to happen within legal frameworks that yeah. are technically not allowed. But can you parse out the convergences and differences between the two? Yes. And I, in fact, for any, I see a few of my students here, but I was talking about Schmidt today. So, what I want to say, just in case I lose my train of thought, is that the Bush administration pursued a very Schmittian argument. I'll explain what that means in one second. And then, ostensibly, the Obama administration doesn't make the same kind of Schmittian claims, but yet has done nothing to necessarily dial it back in obvious. So basically, Carl Schmitt was um, a social or political theorist, uh, you know, a German political theorist, whose specialties were dictatorship and, you know, sort of the power of the sovereign. He was writing in Germany during the Weimar Republic, and basically his arguments were that liberal government, liberals, they're incapable of dealing with real emergencies. They're too committed to the rule of law, to, you know, process, et cetera, et cetera. So he was arguing that, um, you know, really what should happen, what you need is a very strong state. You need a, a strong sovereign who can take control in an emergency, et cetera. Now, he became the theorist for the Nazis, not surprisingly. But his argument in one of his famous lines was, the sovereign is he who decides on the exception, meaning that the sovereign is above the law. The sovereign may abide by the law, but the sovereign is the one who can say, this is an emergency, this is a time to suspend the law, this is a time to act in a way that has the one and only thing, which is to do what the sovereign is supposed to do, which is defend the nation, to kill, I mean, particularly to kill. That kind of Schmidtian logic actually comes to the United States. I mean, one of Schmidt's students, Leo Strauss, goes to you know teaches at the University of Chicago. He is a professor of a number of neocons. You know, so whether or not, I mean, it was a, it was an influential idea of the the unfettered executive that you know sort of um, dictates the way the Bush administration particularly Cheney and those who actually made national security policy were really looking to do the what they call the unitary executive thesis, to unfetter the executive, to say that the, the executive, the president, and all those under his command can do things without the law. It was a very Schmidtian argument. It also, ultimately, though, it was through lawfare. It gets you know, pushed back. Like once cases start going into the courts, I mean, not very many wins, but the few substantial wins basically take the wind out of the sails of that absolutely unfettered president can do whatever he wants. Obama inherits a lot of the policies, um, and for reasons that have to do with domestic US politics, you know, the whole looking forward, not backwards, wanting to be, you know, so postpartisan or whatever. Um, the, you know, he didn't want to confront the crimes of the previous administration. Um, and in fact, in many ways, by not confronting the crimes of the previous administration, he had to then, you know, uh, adopt a much more secretive approach because in fact, he doesn't necessarily endorse certain things that the Bush administration does, but he doesn't want to be pressured 
by public knowledge to pursue accountability for them. So in fact, Obama has utilized secrecy at a level um, unprecedented in US history. Now he makes the claim that what he's doing in these things is actually directed um, you know, by the law as opposed to this unfettered right. You know, the, the paradox or, or the irony or whatever the word would be is that what you're seeing is actually a policy. If, you know, and of course it's the, you know, pointless debate, is, is it worse to be tortured or killed? But, I mean, you know, I mean, Obama has killed vastly more people on the targeted killing policy. I mean, only a dozen or so people were killed, or maybe a couple dozen under the Bush administration. And so, but, but there is this effort to kind of shroud it in a, in a kind of legal thing, but it's secret. So it's like legal and secret. So it's a very, I, I, I'll so, yeah. So I mean, basically, Bush is uh, Schmidt and Obama is a gummy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have a weak, wimpy second. Uh, yes, <laughs> second yeah. end. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm a, a resident of New York City, mm -hmm. and I plan to go back to Fultz. Mm -hmm. And I would like to tell you that there is quite uh, a reaction mm -hmm. along the lines that you are describing mm -hmm. in uh, the states. Mm -hmm. I <clears throat> anticipate that we will have a, a civil war about this. Mm -hmm. It is that serious. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> okay. As long as there's enough lawyers on, on, on staff. <laughs> I think everybody's probably just hot. But anyway, thank you all for your attention.